Well, welcome to the webinar today. I'm Benson Gray from Stroudwater Associates, and we've got a fairly large group today, so everyone will be muted, but there is a space in the GoToMeeting window where you can type in your questions, and we will be making these slides and recording available to everybody after the presentation is over. So first, let me introduce our two speakers. We're going to have Louise Bride, who has 35 years experience in healthcare management and is a clinical operations expert, along with Heidi Larson, who is a family doctor with 25 years of clinical experience. And so without further ado, let me turn it over to Heidi. Thanks, Benson. Welcome to our webinar today, and thanks so much for being on the line with us. Here's our agenda for today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about the background of team-based care and discuss Stroudwater's transition framework to put things into context. We'll define the team-based care model and describe the four core principles of team-based care. Then we'll launch into an explanation of the four-stage office visit and discuss potential benefits of this model for you and your organization. And then we have the pleasure of sharing with you some real life experiences and early results from the implementations that we've done out in the field together. First, we have a polling question right off the bat. So please answer the following. Is your organization facing any of the following challenges? Please check all the boxes that apply. We find that affirmative answers to any of these questions might indicate the need for greater investment in primary care infrastructure one example of which is team-based care. Well, we're getting some pretty good response here, so we'll hold it open for another few seconds to let people click any and all of these that apply on your screen. And looks like we've got pretty good representation here, so we'll close it out and you can see the results. That's great, thank you. Moving right along, <laughs> why implement team-based care? I think a lot of people on the line recognize that the U.S. is currently facing a critical shortage of primary care docs. We have aging baby boomers that are bringing more patients into the market. The expansion of coverage under the Affordable Care Act also brought a lot of new patients into us. There's a projected retirement of about one-third of our primary care practice workforce in the next decade or so. And finally, fewer physicians, new docs coming out of medical school and training are choosing careers in primary care, opting for subspecialty care instead. Physician-led team-based care engages all members of our staff in direct patient care. This includes patients themselves, their families, our front desk staff, our nurses and medical assistants, our physicians, nurse practitioners and PAs, our care managers, everybody. Doing this affords providers the extra time they need to re-engage with our patients, to really sit and listen to people, to make, make eye contact, to listen and be heard and reestablish trusting relationships that I think, quite frankly, we've lost in the last decade or so. This in turn allows the practice to absorb more volume, increasing opportunities to generate revenue, and creates more capacity through enhanced efficiency, allowing us to see more patients in a day, but also allowing us to increase our panel size, which is critical to success under value-based payment models. A little bit more background. When I talk about increasing our investment in primary care, here's what I'm talking about. Our current levels of investment are about five to 6% of total spend. There's been a lot of work out there in the last six or 10 years or so that's, that's uh, hypothesized that if we were to double that to about 12%, we could see up to 15-fold return in our investment. Several groups from different states and payers have done experiments based on just that. And here's some of the results that I wanna share with you. Rhode Island invested 23% more in primary care and saw an 18% total reduction in their healthcare spending over a five-year time period. 
Now, if you look at the resources at the end of this slide deck, that's that um, I'll share with you in there some of the specifics of their findings. But I'll give you a hint now. They mostly invested in care management. Oregon, in their patient-centered primary care home program, found that for every $1 increase in primary care spend, they got $13 in savings. Now, those savings were mostly in specialty care, inpatient, and ED utilization. A 2012 Commonwealth Fund analysis found about the same thing, that if we increased only 10% our investment in our primary care services, we'd get more than a six-fold annual return in lower Medicare costs. And again, that was mostly in specialty care, emergency department, and inpatient utilization, also in post-acute care, which, as we know, is about up to 40% of our spend in Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans. Bottom line, care delivery redesign helps us to build the infrastructure that we need in order to move forward in our payment models and take on risk and take care of the health and well-being of a total population of patients. This is our Stroudwater Population Health Transition Framework. The top three lines, as you can see, relate to the delivery system. The bottom three lines, the payment system. On the left-hand side in phase one, that first column represents fee-for-service or volume-based care, volume-driven only. Way out at the end, phase four, phase five, is a complete shift to full risk models or value-based payments. So this transition framework sort of shows us how we can get from phase one, volume driven, out to phase five, which will be value-based payment models, doing so in lockstep between the delivery system and the payment system. Now we suggest here at Stratton that you try to take these in lockstep so that you're moving along at the same pace in both sides, delivery system and payment system, in order to be successful. The spine of this model is where we're focused today. If you look at that first block, we talk about PCMH and team-based care models. We're talking about building a strong foundation for success through investment in our primary care infrastructure. So what is team-based primary care? Team-based primary care is a restructuring of workflows within the constraints of an already established primary care team. This involves co-location. That's a really important concept. We bring the entire team together, medical assistants, nurses, providers. We bring them together in what we call a flow station so that they're able to talk with each other throughout the day to communicate in real time. No more messages going back and forth all through the day, never getting replied to in the EMR. But if someone calls in, a pharmacist, a specialist, an ER doc, patient, we can look at each other, talk about it, and respond in real time. That's, the, that's one of the core principles of this model. This model does have strong support from the American Academy of Family Physicians and also the AMA. And again, I refer you to the resources at the end of this slide deck, which includes some libraries with step-by-step -step approaches about how to implement such a model. Here's our second polling question. Have any of your primary care practices implemented the team-based care model? And if so, are your teams co-located? So again, we find that being in the same spot throughout the day really facilitates collaboration and communication, also helps to resort, restore some of the joy to practice the medicine. It's more fun when you're working together. Good, we're getting some, some good response. So I will go ahead and uh, close it out here. and. Then we can share what the responses are. Okay. So some of you have implemented, and some of you have teams that are co-located, um, and others have teams that aren't co-located, so that's interesting. Good. Thank you. So we'll go back. On to our four core principles of team-based care. So we just talked about the importance of co-location, bringing everybody that's on the team. And it's a different team in each location, I have to say, where we've implemented. But basically, it's the provider and the support staff, RNs, LPNs, and medical assistants. Also, we include the front desk staff intermittently throughout the day, care managers, and so on. Whoever's on your team is present and accessible throughout the day so that we can talk to each other and collaborate and address concerns in real time. 
Second, we have pre-visit planning. We suggest that we do this at the end of the day for the next day's schedule. So we pull the schedule, we take a look at each patient. We identify care gaps that are due, like colonoscopies and mammograms, for example, and we go ahead and put those orders directly into the EMR in a pending status. So they're not signed, but they're in there, ready to go. We identify patients who don't have an advanced directive and or might benefit from an advanced care planning brochure or discussion to talk about their wishes. We look at those who might be due for CT lung cancer screening or smoking cessation referrals, for example. We go ahead and tee all those up, again, in the course of our pre-visit planning session. We use standardized protocols so that any member of the team can enter these orders. And remember, they're not signed. They're all in a pending status. This is a shared task that we all do together. Next is the daily morning huddle. This should be really quick, five minutes max, standing up, looking at each other, just touching base. How are you doing today? Anybody have a headache? Anybody have a dentist appointment? Anybody have to get out of here early? We include our front desk staff and we look at the schedule one more time and we identify any bottlenecks, any patients who might need some extra time with us. We communicate that to the front desk so that they can come back and check in with us and keep our other patients apprised of any delays that might arise during the day. Lastly, and most importantly, we identify a couple of appointment slots that are open for acute visits. That way, the front desk can respond to patient phone calls and even patients who walk in, perhaps, who need something from us, they can go ahead and, and offer them those time slots that we've already identified without having to run back and check with us at the flow station. It's great for patients, patients love it. Front desk staff feels empowered, it just works better. And then we leverage our four stage office visit to maximize efficiency of the team. Not advancing. Oh, here's our polling question, third polling question. Do, okay. do your medical assistants and nurses remain in the exam room to document in the EMR in real time during the provider visit? That's one of the core concepts that we teach in our implementation. We give the provider time back, face-to-face -face with the patient and the family, and we have the assistant stay in the room to be a part of that team and do a co-visit so that the patient feels more supported. All right. Okay, so most of us don't have them in the room. Okay, close that. And then jump back. A word about the role of medical assistants and nurses. Team-based care does not involve the use of traditional scribes, as we're used to using the term. Instead, this really should be visit, viewed as a co-visit. So the nurse or the medical assistant who's remaining in the room with the physician during the visit is part of the team and is viewed as an extension of that physician, nurse practitioner, or PA. That person uses expanded protocols, pre-populated checklists, all sorts of tools that we've agreed upon and discussed before we start the model to get more information from the patient. Louise is going to describe this in much greater detail in a couple of slides. But that person then stays in the room while the physician is in the room with the patient, giving that patient his or her full attention well, the medical assistant or nurse continues by documenting what's being said and done directly into the EHR in real time. Now I'm going to turn it over to Louise to discuss the four-stage office visit. Okay, thanks Heidi, and good afternoon everyone. As Heidi has uh, just mentioned a moment ago, the four-stage office visit is one of the four core principles of the team-based care model. Each of these core principles supports overall goals of the model to maximally involve and utilize each member of the care team who collectively then work together to deliver efficient, timely, and comprehensive care, as, as Heidi described in the beginning. And as you will see as we go through the four stages, 
each of the stages incorporates increased sharing of responsibilities more broadly across the core care team than is, uh, than is typical in most practices today. And um, I think in that way, really, the, the four-stage office visit in particular demonstrates the changes that occur in the practice to operationalize that team-based care definition that Heidi talked about at the start of the presentation. So let's take a closer look at the, um, at the four stages. And let's see, yes, it does advance, great. So in the office visit stage one, this is really, this stage really focuses on the patient rooming in process and includes some expanded intake activities. Um, and so this stage would be performed by the medical assistant or the nurse, could be an LPN, could be an RN, depending on the staffing configuration in the given practice who during this phase of work, this stage, are focused on gathering and document, documenting data and information from the patient. And this will generally address more, they will generally address more than the usual basic vital signs and reason for office visit that is typical in many practices today. So examples would include a more, a more comprehensive um, set of of questioning perhaps, or certainly um, reviewing and updating with the patient, medical, surgical, family, and social histories, ensuring that key information has been captured and recorded in the medical record. And as Heidi has already mentioned, a way to really maximize the medical assistant or the nurse's role in this stage of the four-stage office visit is to have uh, standing orders and protocols in place. And so specific examples then of how that can really support the work of the MA or the nurse at this point is that it then enables them to review uh, with the patient their health maintenance record and, and identify any, any uh, activities, uh, preventive care or screening activities that may be due or past due, and to go ahead and order those if they are, if they are necessary and if the patient is amenable to doing so. Another example would be at this stage of the game, the medical assistant or the nurse would administer and document any routine vaccinations that are due. Again, performing those functions per established protocols. During this stage, it is also important for the assistant to highlight and to confer with the patient and confirm that medications, any medications due for refill. And as Heidi's already mentioned, it is a great opportunity to use this time to have some conversation when it's appropriate around advanced care planning and to provide whatever materials that the practice has adopted to, to educate the patient around their options and their choices. And then if the individual is interested in doing so, to potentially begin that conversation with them and assist them with um, filling out the forms or at least reviewing and understanding uh, the, the, the next steps. So moving to stage two, uh, generally at the completion of stage one, the assistant has left the exam room and has touched base with the provider to share any information just gathered, um, certainly any priority issues uh, that have been identified by the patient in terms of their concerns or their reasons for the visit. And then the two will join the patient and enter the, the uh, exam room together, so both the provider and the, uh, and the assistant. And as Heidi has already indicated, a really important, very important component of this model is this co-visit activity, which does occur during this stage two of the office visit. So the, the assistant remains in the exam room throughout the visit, seated at the computer and documenting in real time as the provider engages in conversation with the patient and then proceeds to uh, perform the physical exam. This is so key because it does free up the provider to be fully focused on the patient instead of sitting in front of the computer throughout the visit. And you'll hear more about how that is experienced by, by um, patients in this model um, a little later on in our presentation. So then moving into stage three, this really is the, the key component 
of the role of the physician or provider, and that is the medical decision making. So this is the time when the physician or the provider has really assimilated the information that had been pre-gathered during stage one and then has been um, further um, augmented as a result of the provider's conversation with the patient and the findings from the physical exam that then enables the, the provider to uh, have conversation with the patient around uh, his or her thinking about diagnoses and the um, proposed treatment plan. At the same time, the assistant has continued to record pertinent conversation that has taken place between the patient and the provider, and it's also a great opportunity to, at that time, for the assistant to update the problem list if new problems have been identified in the course of this visit to capture any HCC codes, which as many of you know, have become increasingly important from a total uh, reimbursement standpoint. And it also does support ensuring very thorough and complete documentation of the visit in the medical record. Uh, this is also an opportunity for the provider, again, who has been able to be focused directly on the patient throughout this time to invite questions, and to um, ensure that the, that the patient really understands what has been discussed and what the plans are. At this point, the physician is, uh, has completed his or her portion of the office visit, and we now move to stage four. So the provider leaves the exam room. That gives the provider some focus time, uh, briefly usually, but some focus time to review the documentation and to take a look at and to give further thought to his or her findings, the assessment and the treatment plan. And that would include making sure that he or she has documented their thought processes in coming to their um, conclusions around the, the diagnoses and the treatment plan. While that is taking place, while the provider is focused on reviewing and, and finalizing and signing orders, that uh, the, the assistant, meantime, has remained in the room with the patient to close out the visit. So specific activities that are really important from the patient's perspective at this stage will be to spend that time to review and confirm that the patient understands the instructions that have been given to him or her, uh, to review any changes in prescriptions or any new prescriptions, any referrals that the physician or provider have um, recommended and, and to review any new orders that have been given. This is also a great time for the assistant to deliver pertinent patient education and to, to move to carry out any office-based procedures uh, such as obtaining an EKG, performing simple office procedures as an ear lavage and other that may have been ordered uh, by the provider and that the assistant then performs again according to office protocol. Another important component at this point is to ensure that the patient understands the next steps. And so if there are follow-up visits, uh, if there's a follow-up visit that is in intended, that that information is reviewed with the patient to ensure that they are clear on what will happen when they depart the office. That then really concludes stage four. The patient exits and the assistant is then uh, freed up to move on to either rooming their next patient or if they are in between patients, it's, it's then an opportunity for that medical assistant or nurse to check on any incoming voicemails or email messages that may have come in and to uh, respond to those um, during that interval between patients. And meantime, the provider has moved on to his or her next patient with the second clinical assistant who has started this whole process with, with that next patient, uh, starting with the stage one, and then essentially the pairs are repeating that process as they move through the appointment schedule. And that brings us to our fourth and final polling question for today, and that is, uh, really a little bit of a, an additional drill down to one of the elements in the first polling question. And this time we are asking for a little bit more detail related to uh, any experiences your primary 
care practices may be having related to capacity or appointment access challenges. So let me give you a moment to respond to that. Um, as Heidi touched on during the background, her background discussion, capacity and in particular appointment access, primary care appointment access are significant problems for many practices across the country and especially um, that has, uh, has been increasingly true in rural areas. And in particular, lack of timely appointment availability for same-day appointments or timely av availability of follow-up appointments can result in um, ED visits or urgent care visits, um, which then can drive up the total cost of care for that practice and that organization. And it looks like we have our results. Uh, pretty evenly distributed across the options uh, with certainly some um, more than 50% experiencing moderate to significant access problems. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Heidi to share some uh, direct experiences. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm going to talk first about benefits and then we'll move it to Heidi, so sorry. Um, so this is a really, this slide really brings us full circle, and um, we'll take another look at the anticipated benefits of implementing this model. Experience has shown that when a practice adopts and effectively implements, implements the core principles and the key elements of this model, that the practice and then potentially the larger organization can anticipate a number of positive results and benefits. So you see here a number of, of those. Uh, we've touched on throughout the presentation already the value of, of moving to this model in increasing productivity as a direct result of changes in workflow and redistribution of work, again, within the context of the clinical team. We also want to call out the opportunity to increase or to support long-term financial success and sustainability for the practice through potential increases in practice revenue. That can be a result of, uh, and Heidi mentioned this earlier on, but through that better utilization of appointment slots by being able to identify places throughout the day to work in additional patients that can directly result in a larger number of patients being seen, which in turn will increase practice revenue. We have clearly um, shown ways to optimize provider patient time through the co-visit component. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, that can in turn reduce opportunity costs due to um, increased uh, management of conditions in the office setting, reducing potentially the use of the ED for avoidable of visits and also for uh, potentially reduced readmissions. Reductions in clinical variation through the use of standardized protocols may lower direct costs of the practice. Care delivery, we've talked about that throughout the presentation, but this model can support and enhance the delivery of better care through the redesign activities that we've been discussing the increased intentional focus on preventive care and services, both in pre-visit planning, as Heidi mentioned, as well as during that stage one office visit, are ways to increase the access and the delivery of screening and preventive services. And also the increased focus and potential integration of care management can lead to improvements in chronic disease management. A classic example of that would be a closer monitoring of the blood sugar control for diabetics, which can in turn um, improve their overall clinical outcomes. And last but very definitely not least would be the increased collaboration and really um, of emphasis, the emphasis on team-based care can truly then restore the joy in the practice of medicine for providers and staff, which is really all about achieving what many are now calling the quadruple aim. 
I am sure most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the triple aim. Uh, that was a framework put forth by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement a number of years ago. And when you think about it, most of what we have talked about today really are all efforts to support the achievement of the triple aim. And now through the increased collaboration and teamwork, the joy, the restoring the joy in the practice of medicine really helps to achieve that quadruple aim. All of which, when brought together, all of these positive results and outcomes through the redistribution of work, through the increases in productivity, the expanded roles and responsibilities can then collectively lead to an a strengthening and the building of a strong foundation for success as practices increasingly move from a traditional fee-for-service environment to value-based payment model. And with that, I will now pass the baton back to Heidi to tell you more about some specific experiences we've had with clients. Thank you, Louise. This is a schematic representation of redesigned workflows that we described in our four-stage office visit. This is real client data from an implementation that we did recently. The current model that they sent us in their assessment phase on the left, you'll see eight spots open in the morning and eight in the afternoon. Their average rate, their average fill rate was 5.6 per half-day session at the start of this implementation. And they all felt overwhelmed and they felt like they couldn't see a single one more patient in the course of their day. Um, so we came in and we, we set this up in this schematic way so that they could visualize in the proposed model how we were functioning side by side in two adjacent exam rooms with two staff members, whatever they had. The, medical assistants, LPNs, RNs, but those, each of those staff members was working one of these rooms and the provider was going back and forth. So you can see the patient visit duration was the same at 30 minutes, but the provider was going back and forth between the two rooms as we described in the course of our four-stage office visit. Look at what that did for our visit capacity. On the right side, you see that the current slots before we began was 16 per day. At the end, once we fully implemented, we were at 26. That's a 63% capacity increase. In the middle there, you see where we had 21, was after one day of work with the teams. We were able to add a few slots in the morning and a few slots in the afternoon. So we did this gradually. We didn't just go in and, and uh, do it all at once. Now, as I said before, we have the pleasure of sharing with you some actual results from teams with which we've implemented all over the country. Please feel free to ask questions. You can put them in the chat box, and we're really excited to discuss these findings with you. An internal medicine practice that we worked with in the Northeast achieved improved rates of preventive care services, increased their visit capacity, and enhanced their care management activities all within the first six months. Something we noticed that was interesting was we had IT present during the phase one implementation. And one of the first things they noticed was that we each had a different view of the patient on our computer screen. So this was in the context of our pre-visit planning. We realized that we weren't communicating well because we couldn't see the same information about the patient. And IT had built the system not understanding that each person was allowed access to a different part of the system or, or was shown it in a different way. So that gave them the chance to, on the spot, correct that and give us all a standardized view so that we could communicate more effectively. Part of that discussion was about documenting what we were doing with the patient. We started with depression screening. Their baseline MIPS depression screening score was 2%. And that didn't sound right to this team because they were doing the depression screening universally for every patient and having to actually document it in their EHR in several different places. So the IT person, again, watched how we were documenting it. And as it turned out, we weren't checking the right box to get that information to pull through so it would count under our quality metrics. So once we were shown that out of the 
10 possible places to document this, there was actually one that really counted. We took it a step further. Our front desk person offered to administer the depression screening at check-in and go ahead and enter it in that one place that really counted. That resulted in their documentation rates that counted for our quality scores under MIPS to increase from 2 to 40% after three months. With the same team, we leveraged our pre-visit planning and our morning huddles to increase patient same-day visit access. This was mostly for people who called in and wanted those same-day appointments, sick visits mostly. They were pretty quick. We started by adding one in the morning and one in the afternoon and so on, gradually increasing. They increased the visit volume for their team from 90% of capacity to 124% in just six months. Lastly, with the same team, we had a nurse care manager who was assigned to our team, but she was in a different part of the building. So she attended our pre-visit planning session and figured out a way that we could flag her in her screen view of the EHR to let her know when there were patients coming in whom she either already followed in the course of her care management activities or perhaps patients who would benefit from her extra support and attention. And then she came at the end of the visit with the provider and did a co-visit in person with that patient in the place of her regularly scheduled monthly telephone visit. This was something that the patients really liked. They really liked that extra attention. They liked meeting her in person. And one story really comes to mind. There was a, a very grouchy uh, retired nurse um, who was oxygen dependent, had end stage COPD, and a medication list as long as your arm. And she was frustrated. She was visiting the emergency department an average of six times per month for exacerbations because she couldn't get in when she had an acute need. This care manager sat with her and gave her her card with her direct line phone number so that the patient could call her directly next time she had an exacerbation and avoid those ED visits. And we could, on our end, then work her into one of our available slots so that we, the team who knows her, who understands the course of her illness, could readily provide the support that she needed. Here's a great story out of Nebraska. We arrived on site and the CEO said, this is great, this team-based care implementation is gonna be great. Don't talk to the front desk. Don't look at the front desk. Don't talk to the front desk. I've been through it with my front desk. We had to have consultants come in last year and rework their whole workflow, their whole all their processes because they were all ready to quit. Everything's great now at the front desk. Please don't mess with it. I said, all right, okay. So you know what happened next. Sitting back in the flow station with the team, the first day is a little hectic. There's a lot of noise, a lot of people talking back and forth. And by the end of the day, we're starting to laugh and things are starting to lighten up a little bit. And guess who wanders back to the flow station? The front desk person. And she wants to know what we're doing, what's going on. So we shared with her our pre-visit planning process. And in the course of looking at our diabetics for the next day, she realized that there was an opportunity for her to reach out to our diabetics to make sure that they'd had their eye exams. And if they had, to go ahead and get those documented in the records so that we would have it at the time of the visit. And then she took it a step further. She wrote up a protocol for herself that, that she owned that she could adapt or, or stop if she wanted to. But she wrote up a protocol to check with the diabetics who were scheduled for the next two weeks to call them and see if they'd had their diabetic eye exams. If they had, she recorded it in the record. And if not, she offered to help them schedule it so that we would have the results at the time of the visit so that it could be reviewed in the context of their diabetic follow-up visit. As a result, she was able to increase our documented screening for diabetic retinopathy from a baseline of 21% to 42% in the first 30 days of implementation. Another practice in the Southeast significantly increased their tetanus vaccination rate by just by changing a little bit in their workflow. We identified in our pre-visit planning who was due for vaccinations and empowered that person's medical assistant in this case to go ahead and administer that 
vaccination in the room with the patient during stage one of the office visit and document it. In doing so, we almost doubled the vaccination rate for the whole year just in that first month of implementation. We talked a little bit about incorporating advanced care planning into the rooming process. Several of the groups that we've worked with have a standardized tool that was developed or produced by the palliative care service line in the hospital. So we got some of those tools. They were brochures like conversation starter kits, hello kits, five wishes brochures. You've probably seen them. But we used the same tool that was being used in other parts of the hospital, in oncology, for example, in the inpatient uh, units, to introduce the concept of advanced care planning to our patients during the, the uh, stage one of the four-stage office visit. We also started weekly team meetings. I'm a huge fan of weekly team meetings because it gives us a chance to air our grievances with each other, to talk about what's going well and what's not going well. It allows us to be nimble and change things and make it right and keep going forward, to use our mistakes as opportunities to do better. It also has the added bonus of helping us to get to know each other better so that we can understand each other's special interests and talents and leverage those in the course of our day. Plus, it just makes the whole thing a lot more fun. Bottom line, we don't all have to be experts in everything, and there's a huge value in collective intelligence. We love our patients. We check in with our patients every time we're doing an implementation, every single one. We have the front desk inform the patient and the family is present that we're trying something a little bit different. We, we ask them to, to bear with us while we try this, and then we ask for feedback when the patient's checking out. These are some quotes from patients during our implementation process. They said they really liked it. They felt like it was more personal. They felt more taken care of. One person said it's like a family environment. All in all, the team is viewed as an extension of the physician. Patients told us that they felt like they were more heard and that if they called back with a question or a need after a visit, they knew that the nurse or medical assistant with whom they were speaking had actually been in the room, so they had more trust in what was being relayed to them from the provider. And they also, they probably didn't know that we were all sitting at a flow station when we got those calls, right? So there was a lot more communication all around. Interestingly, in one practice, we started getting calls from patients who'd heard from other patients about what we were doing, and they wanted to come in before their visit to get their lab work done and to get everything taken care of so all the results would be available to review with their doctor at the time of their appointment. Another interesting thing was that more patients were requesting portal access in the EHR at the time of checkout after experiencing a team-based team -based visit. Providers and staff also really liked this. The, the overwhelming um, feedback was, was positive. I think the first parts of the implementation are, are a little tricky, um, and it's important to, be, to acknowledge that every team is different and to, um, to adapt to, to what we're doing and have the team to, to set up some guardrails and help the team understand the basic concepts, but then get out of the way and let them apply the model in a way that makes sense for them. One nurse said, and I'm going to change this editing back, our editor edited it for me, but it's actually y'all, this would be y'all are listening to us now, this is in the South, y'all are listening to us now, that's a big deal, she said. Another nurse said, I feel more directly involved in patient care, I'm actually using my nursing skills. I think that's really important because these nurses and medical assistants will become our champions as we scale this model across the organization. One of the core concepts that Louise and I share with teams as we're implementing is that this is a train-the-trainer approach. When Louise and I are on site with a team, we're helping the organization to build a scalable model. Once it works with one team, the teams can spread it throughout the organization. An office manager who was watching us said that actually she, she saw that we had created a level playing field where every team member was empowered to speak up. She said, you used your whole team on the field. A second office manager seconded that and said, um, trust your team. Their front desk staff at that 
practice was just adorable. They were new, two very young, new front desk people in a new space from only let's see, three months before we implemented. And they were very gung-ho, very excited. And they said, we love the huddle. It works. Again, we were empowering them to do more from that front desk position. As I said before, collectively we embraced our mistakes. We saw them as opportunities. We stayed nimble. We asked each other, what is the rock in your shoe? We paused for feedback several times during the day, especially during the implementation phase. One physician actually said to us at the end of the first day that the model had changed her life. She was able to leave the office with all of her work done at the end of the day. No more pajama time. We all know what pajama time is, right? That's the time we're spending until midnight documenting and checking boxes in the EHR. Well, she wasn't doing that anymore. Right off the bat after implementing. One of our, uh, our lead docs in another practice said she used to use her vacation days to catch up on paperwork and she still wasn't finishing up everything. She said, we're seeing high rates of depression and burnout in our healthcare workers. There's a reason for that, but there are also fixes. This is one of those fixes. That's all we have today. I have one question that came in um, about someone out there says they have 12 providers and only one front desk staff person, and they were wondering how this could work in that setting. And um, I have to say to you, first of all, that front desk person is a hero or a heroine. Cherish that person because that, that's a really tough position to be in. Um, as I mentioned before, every setup, every team is different. When we go in and what we do is teach the basic model and then we help the team to adapt it in a way that works for them. Clearly that single front desk person can't be running back and forth to every flow station throughout the day as we talked about earlier. But we would help you to adapt the model so that that person feels empowered. Does that make sense? Anyone have any other questions? Or Louise, do you have any comments? No, I, I think that's good. I think we can, uh, that we are open for other questions. And I think Benson, you had some closing remarks to okay. share with us as well. Absolutely. It, uh, as I mentioned before, the, there's a chat box and there's a question section in the GoToMeeting uh, window that you have where you can type in your questions. And we have had a few others come in in the meantime. And so, We'll give you a minute to type in. I also want to draw attention to that we have a list of resources at the end of this presentation and the contact information. But the other question that came in was, how long does it take to implement the basic team-based care model? This is Heidi. I'll go ahead and, and take that. I think the biggest part of the implementation is in the preparation, just like with about just about anything, right? Any big project. We want to hire and train staff so that we're ready to implement with a full staff. Remember that we need two support people at a minimum per provider and two exam rooms to do this model properly. It's also important that we develop our standardized protocols so that we can use those in the context of team-based care. We should probably get those protocols done and approved ahead of time. Having said that, we're usually on site for two days for the first part of the implementation. Then we give the teams a chance to sort of adapt and, and sit and, and uh, work in the model for a while, and we go back for a second phase and help them fine tune. Finally, there's a third phase of additional support that's offered afterwards for an ongoing six months. Louise, do you have anything to add to that? The, the other, I think the other big lesson learned for us as we have done this work, and that is how important it is for the that core clinical team, the, the assistants who will be doing the co-visit, doing the real-time documentation, how important it is that they uh, have the necessary training to, and as Heidi mentioned earlier in the presentation, are also set up to have access to the necessary fields in the and the necessary um, templates and screens in the uh, in the electronic health record, so that they are able to then in a, in a very um, efficient way to perform that documentation function during that stage of the office visit. And that that does, in some instances, take some time, and there is a, a need to work closely with the IT 
team that supports the practice in order to have that piece of it go smoothly as a component of the early implementation. Okay, well, we've got, uh, also there was a clarification. The uh, It was not just one front desk person for all the multiple, there was actually one front desk person per provider. Oh, in this case. much better. <laughs> and, I'm smiling. And there was there was also a question about how long the weekly team meetings typically are. I like an hour. I, when I was in practice, had a full hour with my team. Every Wednesday afternoon, we brought lunch, and I used to ask a question the night before, an open that did question, and then I would let people think about it and bring their, their answers to the, to the meeting. And I was quiet for that hour. I listened to my team and, and let them sort of work through the glitches, share, as I said, failures, see them as opportunities, laugh some, bond some. Um, but I, I really tried to stay on the periphery. Okay, and we've also had a question. Has there been an experiment with the team model to include not just provider and two nurses, but two providers and an associate to make up a team? Louise? Well, I'm wondering if uh, the person asking that question could to, could uh, define what the, uh, who the associate is. Would that be the, the medical assistant or nurse position that we've been uh, discussing? I'm, I'm assuming well, we'll, so. Well, we wait for. Well, we wait. Uh, a R N P P A was the answer. Okay. 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 Very good. So, so I think um, as as Heidi mentioned earlier, the ideal configuration is at the at the team level would be to have two assistants supporting one provider, and that can be a physician a nurse practitioner, a PA, any any of those we really are counting or including as a provider for purposes of this entire conversation, but that there would be ideally two assistants per one provider to keep that flow going that we've talked about and that Heidi showed on that revised, <clears throat> excuse me, appointment scheduling template so that as one clinical assistant is in the room going through the um, the four stages of the office visit that we've discussed, the second assistant is busy receiving and rooming and starting that process again uh, with a second patient, and then the physician moves from one room to the other. It would be very difficult, I think, for one assistant to support two providers in this model. Um, there would be There would certainly need to be some pretty significant adaptation and what we would want to do is just, um, you know, work with that with that practice to really look at the total set of resources and, you know, think creatively about how we might be able to work with with you to adapt the model. Um, Heidi, other thoughts that you might have for that scenario? That that is a challenging one, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I think I think it's important to have that support. There. There was also a follow-up question to that, and then we'll go on to another question about do the providers have a day off, and who covers the patients during absences? The providers typically work four, four days or 32 um, clinical hours per week in general. That's, that's the standard in primary care. However, the support staff, the medical assistants and nurses, are usually there five days. So the support staff is there even when the provider is not there to field any questions about the visit, to offer refills, um, things like that. And of course, um, this is an aside, but I always recommend that the provider and the team work very closely together so that, that the team's able to reach out to the provider if there are any questions. Okay, we have a, another question. What's the largest number of practices that you've seen successfully implement this model? And do you have any sense of the cost to operate under this team care model? The largest number of practices that we've done in a single implementation at once was five, five teams uh, spread out across different settings within the same system. 
And again, this was intended to be a scalable model that the organization, once they got things working smoothly, uh, could go ahead and use a train-the-trainer approach to spread. Uh, the cost, I think, in my opinion, pays for itself. Because first of all, you're able to add more volume in the course of your day um, that will pay for the additional staff if you require a second uh, staff person, if you don't already have that on your team. And I think with an eye to the future, what's really the biggest benefit is to be able to increase our panel size. If we're thinking about value-based payment models, it's really our income is based on the number of patients included in our population that we're managing. Does that make sense? Okay. And the um, looks like I know we're getting close to the uh, to the end of the time. We don't want to run over here. So I know there are still some questions out there, and we will have Heidi and Louise get back directly to answer those on a more individual basis. And if we can, uh, we also have some resources here that we have been mentioned throughout the presentation that certainly are available. And as I said, we'll be sending this, a link to this presentation out to everyone so that you can have hard copy of this that you can chase down. And of course, also the contact information is available. So that if you want to contact Louise or Heidi directly, this is how you can reach them, and please feel free to uh, to reach out. So with that, I will say thank you very much for taking your time out of your busy day today, and we appreciate it, and uh, hopefully we can help you with this and other endeavors. Thanks.